All right, this is video number three. This is a uh, setup and electronics. So this video, I'm gonna, <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna not build so much and kind of go over my setup. And this is, this is basically where we're at from the last two videos. We built the front end we built the back end and the gearbox, and I'm gonna go from this car, uh, this a good friend of mine, Brian's, um, I'm gonna show what I'm gonna put in that car, and then I'm gonna go over this car's setup. Uh, so, this is where we're at with the video. The electronics I'm gonna put in this car, it's gonna be a Phantom motor. I know everything's gonna be backwards, but either Phantom 3.0 or 3.5, uh, the R1, uh, digital speed control, digital three. And one thing to note on the digital three, uh, I had this guy, super talented soldering guy, uh, Ethan, out at Hobby Action. Uh, he re-soldered 10 gauge wire on the, uh, the digital three because I think the original solder joints on the 12 gauge, uh, hey Frank, they're not the best. So I had it rewired at, at 10 gauge. Uh, it seems like 12 gauge worked fine. I ran fast with 12 gauge, 10 gauge works even better, but just to be safe, uh, if you're going to run these speed controls, I would highly recommend putting bigger wire on it and re-soldering because their factory solder joints don't, uh, aren't, aren't the best. There's some dry solder joints coming out there. I've seen, uh, three or four of these speed controls that have them now. So that's the speed control that's going to go in his car. Um, batteries are an option. Um, I've run as small as this battery, which is a 1450 max amps. If you're going really light, I've gone as big as this, uh, max amps battery, 6,500. I'm running kind of a, uh, this one's a great one too. I'd recommend any one of those. Uh, what's going on, Frank? Um, I'm actually running a battery. That's this, this battery in, in paralleled in one package that max amps is making for us. Uh, works well so any one of these batteries work work really good uh, this one i probably wouldn't run uh bigger than like a four or five motor uh, it has limitations but it's extremely light it's only about i think it's less than 100 grams like 91 grams so if you're going to really light this is a battery that i'd run okay so that's the electronics i'm going to put in there uh, as far as the servo mount um the servo in this car is i didn't even put holes in the chassis for the servo mount because there's so many options out there. And uh, this is the mount that I have in my car. I know the, the part number is gonna be backwards, but it's TLR231083. It's the servo mount for the 2250. And it's these, uh, it's these little L brackets. And there's one, basically it's one, uh, one bolt in the bottom that goes into the chassis and two bolts that go into the servo. Uh, pretty simple, but there's, a dozen different types of these so we didn't want to lock you into one type we didn't drill a hole in the chassis for it um but i'll show you what's critical in drilling the hole it's real easy and and the servo mounting can be it's not a super critical hole so uh don't stress out about drilling it you're gonna do fine <laughs> uh so i'm gonna take the body off of this i'll show you the servo mount and then we'll kind of go over some setup stuff and uh this is the car we're gonna I'm gonna kind of use this for the rest of the video to show you the setup on this car. Okay. This stuff over here. All right. So you can see in this, I'll do the best I can in the video, but servo, uh, I drilled two holes in the bottom here and here, uh, mounts the servo. And the critical thing to look at when you're mounting the servo is once you put the servo arm on is you just want the servo arm to be free. So when it moves back and forth, it's not obstructed by the rack and you have a pretty good, uh, Hey Jeff, how you doing? Uh, you have a pretty good error there if you, if you get it a little bit off, but critical point is just don't have the servo so close to the rack that it, it hits the rack. Um, I'm running this this servo pretty high. I'm actually running on the top hole in the mount. Uh, so I get a really good angle on that link. And the 5.0 rack, that's what I'm trying to get is it moves this ball stud in and I don't get as clean or as straight of a shot. So that's why 
I like the 4-0 rack a little bit better as it gives you a really straight shot on the servo. You get a really good geometry on the, the steering link. So um, that's the servo. Uh, I do, I'll, I'll share a part number of um, a, a really small servo and we make a mount that we'll post uh, for sale. If you want to run a really small servo, there is holes drilled uh, down, down the bottom for this really small servo mount that goes under the rack. But I have to warn you, it strips out pretty easy. Uh, if somebody can find a uh, a servo saver, it would probably be better, a better situation, but I broke three of them and, and I went away from it after the weight rule increased. So, uh, the advantage that that does when you want a really small servo is I'm able to run this battery all the way up next to the rack. And then you move this all the way up and it, the, all the electronics move forward. So you get more front weight, which uh, I've always been trying to get all the weight up in front. So, uh, it, it saves about 30 grams and I, I'm able to move the weight that's in the electronics, including battery, which is real heavy, up, up a little bit more. But uh, the current setup that's really hauling is standard standard size servo. This Max Amps, it's a 29, I think it's a 29, 2900 uh, dual core battery behind it that's kind of a brick, and then the ESC behind that. And the uh, I just run the receiver on the side, it's hard to see with the plug, but just stick it on the side along with the switch. Um, and one thing to note too is that I, I don't really mount anything back here. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I want to keep that free so it, it, there's a flex there. This From the waterfall forward is where the chassis starts flexing. <coughs> Excuse me. And I never really wanted to tape anything or strap anything or affect that flex. So I'm usually putting everything up front and leaving this back a couple inches bare so that uh, there is this free float of the, of the chassis back there to flex. Um, it, it's, it's done well for me. I know a lot of people mount all their stuff in the back and there's, there's all sorts of different configurations and you can mount your electronics anywhere you want, but uh, at least from what I've seen, that's, the, that's an important part of the, the flat chassis that allows it to flex. So uh, I'd recommend not mounting anything in the back and keeping everything as forward as you can. Okay. Uh, shocks so this has 40 weight shock wear all the way around and this car at least in the front is a little different for the, the the signal that the shock gets because the front is so laid down so even though it's the same shock oil front and back uh the back's pretty stiff and the front is very light because uh the shocks are really laid down in the front so they're not as active so uh a good place to start is 40 weight um, if anything, you might go up in the back. I think I'm a little bit light, but 40 weight's a good place to start. So if you want to test some things, start out at 40 weight all the way around, maybe go up as much as 50 to 60 in the back and see what you like better. But uh, if the track's a little bit rough or um, a little bumpy, then you might want it a little bit loose to kind of absorb some of that. Uh, the, and the, there's a lot of way to limit the shocks. Uh, <coughs> this gets, this is the way I do it. Um, there's a lot of different setups, so I'm not saying this way is the only way or the right way. There's, that's what's cool about this is there's a lot of ways to go fast. People do it in all sorts of different ways. So this is my way to uh, get as fast as I can is I, I run the shocks limited where all the way down when it hits the stops, uh, I have about, I'd say, three-eighths of an inch or less under the chassis. So the chassis cannot scrub the ground. And then currently I have it to where the up travel goes all the way till the suspension arm hits the chass hits the chassis. So I run, uh, I believe they're Proline little rubber stops in the shocks. Um, so all the way down is, is not hitting the chassis by about three eighths of an inch and all the way up is as far as the travel you can get with this chassis, it hits the, I'm using the chassis as the, the droop uh, stop. Uh, the way it sits, it stands with the body is it sits almost all the way collapsed, so all the way down. So I have the springs run up really high, and I want the reaction of the car to move up when it launches. So it sits, I don't sit on the bump stops because having a hard stop in the front gets makes the uh, initial shock really sensitive to spring pressure in the back. So I, I do have it floating on the shock. Um, but just barely, like the last couple millimeters of the shock throw when the body's on. Uh, and I'm running the stock pistons. I think that's, that's about it for the front shock. So rear shocks, 
Uh, I'm running this completely stock geometry and stock. These are the 4.0 shocks, but I, the 5.0 shocks are the same, same shock with a different cap. Uh, 40 weight in the back, stock pistons. And what I do in the back is I try and get the dog bone fairly level. It's almost at the top of its travel. There's a little bit of up travel, like when it sits on that, with the body on it, I'll have a little bit of up travel, but the car sits pretty high in the back. Uh, I do that, I think the higher the car sits, the more it wants to wheelie, but the more it generates traction. It's kind of like a, when you, a bar stool where if you, if you have high weight and you, you accelerate, it, it has this, I call it like a bar stool effect, but there's this like pendulum where it, it wants to lift the front. So if you take a big jacked up truck, put a lot of power on it, it'll wheelie. If you take a super low Formula One car, you can never wheelie it, right? The, it has to do with the, where the center of gravity is. So my center of gravity in the back or the, my right height is pretty high. Uh, I'm running uh, outside, very outside on the top shock on the stock uh, uh, shock tower. And then I'm running on the outside on the, on the suspension arm. The spring, you can run stock springs. Uh, I'm, I, would, I would try and find the stiffest spring for the back that you can find. I'm running a very big spring. I got a pile of springs. I felt them all. I'm just running, I'm not sure what it is, but it's the stiffest spring I could find. Uh, and, and in the front, I'm running the, the stock buggy sh spring, but the front's not, the front's kind of along for the ride. It's not real active, right? Uh, it's, it's hovering down the track the entire time. So the front, front spring isn't critical. Uh, really the only thing critical on the front is to make sure everything is lined up completely straight and there's no bump steer uh, and everything is nice and smooth and floating. So um, spring on the back, the heaviest you can find. I would just use the kit spring on the front uh, and you'll be, you'll be good to go. Uh, so tra uh, travel limits on the, on the back, I'm, I'm letting the, the suspension hit the, the chassis. So as much droop as I can have, and there's no, there's no limit on the down travel. So the shock is, uh, really not, not hardly limited at all. I've run it to where it's, uh, it's limited a little bit and rides above the limit of the, of the tap of the chassis but currently I'm letting it hit the chassis and there's no down travel limit in the back. We'll get into a little, I, there's a couple different setups, but at least with this bar with the shocks on it, um, and I'll go over that a little bit, that's the setup that seems to work. So pretty level or high in the back, pretty low in the front with the body on, and when it launches, it'll lift the front and kind of squat the back a little bit and works well and running no anti squat it kind of promotes this squat and planting the bar the wheelie bar in the back uh i wanted to show you this can be a little difficult to show but i'm gonna put the body on and i'm gonna scale it and this is something i do before every race and and i've heard people joke about it, and i never use a scale and and that's you know bullshit or whatever but uh, i like to get the car as neutral and as flat as i can before the race so when i start adjusting to get it to go straight i know i'm starting with a level chassis and as equal uh pressure on each tire as i can get and i even document uh, what the weight bias is front to back and how the car ran so that um weight bias front to back is is really big so i'll explain why but i'll show you we put the body on i always weigh with the body on uh, I want to know what the weight is, the way it's running down the track, and the body can change the weight a pretty good amount. Normal bodies are as light as 220 grams, and they get over 300 grams, so they severely affect the weight bias of the car. Throw this on. I wanted to try to do the video tonight to not have uh, so much building and have a little bit more information. And it's a lot of information and I'll go through it as fast as I can so it's not a super long video, but I thought I could pack more in the video if I did it this way, at least for the, the setup part of it. Okay, so I'm gonna move the camera, set this thing on here and see if you can see it. I got this four wheel scale. I'm gonna give you an example of what this does. Get it 
it all set up. You have to get all four tires on it, get everything freaking lined up. Okay, that's a pretty good example. So I take this, let me flip this around if I can. I'm not sure how to flip it. So if I can, I'll do this. So if you look, I have the numbers going to be backwards, but right now I'm 3466 and a 5050 bias. So what that means is, uh, and this reverse text thing is really screwing me up. <laughs> um, so what that means is I'm 34% on the front. This actually was 35 last time I weighed it. So very close to 35 on the front and 65% of the weights on the back. And I've run as much as 40% on the front and 60% on the back. But with this configuration and this wheelie bar, um, this... Uh, this is a dual wheel wheelie bar. It's a shock absorb kind of moves, right? So I got a movement and it's a dual dual wheel. So I'm, I'm a little bit biased to the back to try and sit on the wheelie bar a little bit more. It's funny because you see these cars that just rip down the track and they're on they're on the wheel they're on the wheels the entire time. But their weight bias might be as like, you know, more than 70, 30 or even uh, 75, 25, where that's all this weight on the back. So it, that's not necessarily, it might look fast, but I've never seen one that's heavy weight bias to the back be really fast. And I've had a car at 60, 40 weight bias, so 40% of the weight on the front carry the tires all the way down the track. That's fast and that's hard to do because you got so much weight up front. I think the battery was actually on the bumper when I did that. So uh, a, good, a good zone to stay in is if you're gonna run a, a single wheel bar where you're not really relying on the bar and it's a stationary bar, I try, and, I try and get about 60 on the back, 40 on the front, keep the front end down and off the bar. If, uh, if, if I run a dual wheel or I wanna plant the wheelie bar with a shock, I'm, I'm moving five to seven or 8% to the back to actually promote a little bit of a wheelie and it, it sinks the wheelie bar into the ground good, gives me some traction and stability. Uh, okay, so. We'll move on, that's kind of the weight, right? So this thing weighs about 1,940 grams the way it sits. Uh, it's good for the, the 480 races here. It's a little light for MPRC. So if I had weight, I'm probably gonna add it on the front because it definitely has enough power to wheelie pretty hard. Um, I personally think, and it's a gray area, is something I'm really researching hard, is the wheelie bar is uh, a big component of the speed. Uh, I have a very simple chassis. I made it as simple as possible. I've seen some amazing looking chassis that are like works of art. I just saw uh, Greg Bridgewater's chassis and it's, I mean, it's beautiful. There's some really good uh, work done in a few of these chassis coming out. I'm, I'm going as simple as I can get, as, as inexpensive. And I personally think there's not a lot of advantage in the really uh, exotic chassis. It's in the bar and the bar that I'm running right now is here. This is a vanishing point wheelie bar. Uh, I've, I've talked with Troy extensively. I think he's got one of the best bars out right now and we're working on something to fit this car a little bit better. Um, but I've, I'm running a, I'm running a shape waist mount, which is heavy. It's not ideal, but it's, it's fairly strong. I haven't broken it yet. Uh, Troy makes the bar and uh, these are just TLR front shocks and uh, my goal when the car, I'm new to, I've only ran it for a few weeks, but I've run faster than I've ever ran with this bar and it feels more stable. And I've run Troy's cars and they're super stable. So learning from Troy and the Vanishing Point car, I put his bar in my car and uh, it's, it's good. So this setup, I'm running a little bit softer in the back, a little bit more travel in the back. Um, and even a little bit more travel in the front. And the goal is, I don't have a long enough board, but I want when the front lifts up to have the, the tires in the back start touching the ground or really close to it. So when it does wheelie, uh, the back tires are gripping on the ground and the goal is to get the body pushing down on the car and all six wheels are on the ground and it makes a two foot long car and it's 
really, really stable. Hey, Sean. Um, like the, the magic run is to, to do a wheelie out of the hole, have the car really dig good and, and launch good, and then have the body start pushing the front end down mid-track, and you get this really stable downforce with all the tires on the ground at the end, and you can really put down a lot of power. So this car is set up where it's, it can do that a lot of the time, and it, it works really well. So I'm running a little bit more than normal travel in the back and a lot more than normal travel in the front to give the wheelie bar the movement to dig and still have the front tires on the ground. If I limit the front end a lot, then it just runs front end up all the way down and I can't steer. So uh, I'm giving it a little bit more front end travel. So the other setup that I had that works really good, uh, and this is kind of an over the counter one I want to show you guys is, grab this. So this is, this is Tyler's car. Uh, same chassis, it's identical design, it just, it just identical car, it just has an RX-8 in it instead of the R1. Uh, big motor, big fan of motor. He's got the, the Vader bar. So this is a single wheel bar. When I run, this is the bar I would recommend putting on the car uh, right away. And we're working on a, a wheelie bar from Vanishing Point. Not sure the details yet, but we'll, we're gonna have an option to have a, a suspension style wheelie bar. Uh, if you guys wanna try and make one, you could purchase a vanishing point bar and the Shapeways mount and, and TLR front shocks and you'll get yourself pretty close. There's a couple of things you gotta you modify. Um, but if you wanna attempt it and are having issues, message me and I'll, I'll give you uh, any information I got on, on this setup. The easiest way to go and this is over the counter and it's really nice is the Exotech Vader bar. I've run this a lot. I've gone in the 220s with this bar. Uh, it bolts right on. It's really strong. I like the kind of Exotech has a cool, has a cool style where they got a single sided wheel. So uh, for the kits that went out there for the ease of a bar and not having to, to customize a lot of stuff, this is the bar I'd recommend. And I think this right now is the only one made for lo a low C car. If you don't run this and you run a Merton slash style, uh, you're going to have to go get the Shapeways mount to get the, the slash bolt pattern. And remember, you can see on the back wall, like, like all of these, what can I do? All of these bars I've tried, right? I got uh, Jake's Performance and DRP and, you know, all the, the major bars, and they're all about the same. Um, if I'm not running a shock absorb bar, I like the single wheel Vader bar, and I limit the front travel more, about half the front travel and I move weight forward. So I'm not relying on the bar as hard. When I have a shock absorb bar, I run more front travel, a little softer suspension, and I move the weight back about 5% so that it relies on this bar a little bit more. It you know, I, I, can, I, can gain the, I can gain the stability of the bar by putting it on the ground a little bit more than if I don't have a suspension on it. If I lean on this bar really hard, uh, the car gets kind of unstable, so. That's the difference in the two bar designs. Hang on. Uh, let's see what else I got. Tires. So I could spend, I could spend a lot of time on tires. Um, I'm running currently a reaction tire. I want to show you, you know what? Hang on a second, I do have something to show you. I'm gonna take one of these tires off. This would be good to see. So, reaction tire, and uh, this is a tire that I made in the front, but the, the front tire is kind of along for the ride. My goal with the front tire is to try not to gain a lot of traction in the front, so I'm running a, uh, a carpet tire that I sanded down smooth, so it's kind of like a plastic tire. It doesn't generate any traction, so the car pushes down the track instead of hooks if, it, if I got to steer it. So... Me personally, I'm looking for zero traction in the front where it just barely moves if I turn the wheel. Uh, let me pull a tire off and I'll show you something that's pretty important on the rear tire. And I'm running foams. Uh, this is, these tires are prepped by Frank Greer. He knows his stuff when it comes to making traction. So, put this car aside for a sec. So I got this little balancer. I know I've, I've used this to track, I've let people borrow it, but this is a uh, a good tool to have. I think I, I got it for like 25 or 30 bucks on Amazon. 
And what I'll do is stick the tire on. And even before I glue it, and I should probably, I mean, I could make a video on how to make tires, but when you look at this tire, I got, I can spin it. And if you see it, it's really, really true. There's almost no movement to it. So <coughs> I'll sit here without it glued and get it spinning super true on the, on the rim. So if there's any movement at all, this thing's gonna go friggin' 70 miles an hour. It'll hop. And when it hops, you don't generate any traction and it can pull one way. So to get a car to go really straight, tires are really really important so this is a, a, a belted tire that doesn't expand and it fits really good on the rim and it runs really true but I got this balancer that I can spin the tire before I glue it and make sure it's running and it's seated correctly on the bead and then I'll, I'll put it at an angle and and lift the tire and start gluing it around and make a really good glue bead and when I'm done I spin it uh, and make a nice a nice even bead all the way around with the glue tip. Let it dry, repeat it on the front side. Uh, let it dry really good. And then, uh, and I'll probably end up making a something that goes over and build a set of tires to show you guys. But uh, the, the fast version is get it glued, get it dried. And then once it's dry, I'll put it back on this balancer again. And you can see, this is the tire I ran this last weekend. Uh, it's got a little little clay in there. So I'll spin this tire and the bearings in here are pretty good and I can watch to see if it has a heavy side. So this is actually balanced pretty good. It's still balanced well. And I'd say after every weekend or a good amount of runs, I'll check the balance of the tire. So the tire needs to run true when you spin it, but it also needs to be very balanced. Uh, if you ever seen one of these tires at what 70 miles an hour looks like in one of these tires, it's ridiculous. So the, the, the better balance you can get and the truer that it runs, the better shot you got at the car going straight. And it's extremely important. You look at the, the fast guys here in Arizona and they're putting a lot of time into this, the tire. When you do a burnout, they, they sound really true. The cars run super smooth. Um, this is probably the easiest tire to mount when you get into the Panthers and the raw speeds and some of the other tires that are popular. Uh, they're not belted, so they're putting bands in them, and, and I've done it, and spending a ton of time to get this end result where it spins really, really true. So I uh, can't stress that enough, especially for people that are just getting into it. Take a lot of time in building the tires. It makes a world of difference. It can save your car from not crashing into something because it's not going straight. Uh, and it brings up another good point too, is if my car's pulling hard, I'll, uh, I'll take the tires and swap them. And I do mark these. This one isn't the one marked, the other one's marked, but I'll mark passenger or you know, right left so I know which tire goes on which way. Uh, and if I'm having a problem with the car really pulling one way and it doesn't make sense, uh, then I'll switch the tires and see if it pulls the other way. And then I know it's a, it's a belt blown out or the tire has failed in some way. Uh, so it's a good, good tuning tool. And I'll know if something's strange because usually I'll have a little bit of stagger in the back, uh, but not, or wedge, or yeah, I think that's the term now people are using, but not a lot. If I start getting a lot of variance, then something else is wrong, something mechanically wrong, that I have to put that much pressure one way or the other to get it to go straight. And I think uh, if I showed you the, where's the car here? Right now to get a good weight bias, you can see I'm, if you look at the spring collars, they're pretty close to level. Uh, one of them might be a turn or two. This one may be just a little bit lower. But if I got to go more than that on the difference between right and left, something's wrong. And what can happen when you get a lot right to left uh, is the chassis actually starts angling a little bit. Then it screws up your, your droop and you want to have your springs as level as possible so that your chassis sits as level as possible. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that's about it. Um, I don't know if, uh, <laughs> hey Troy, okay, I'll give you a call. I think that's about all I have. Um, I'm always uh, up for, oh, you know, I do have one more thing. Um, let me put this back on here. Body mounting. So there's something to that too, where, uh, I go through kind of a process to mount the body tire on temporarily so
So I like this body. This has the most downforce, I think, out of all the bodies out there right now that I've tried. It probably puts four to five pounds smashing down on the car at the end, which holds everything down, gives you a lot of traction. So uh, when I when I mount the body and try to figure out the body height, uh, I will mount the body. Get these holes here. get this thing on here okay there we go okay so the first thing I do when I mount the body is now that we've got the shocks limited where uh, the down travel doesn't hit uh, the, the chassis on the ground I'll mount the body it'll probably be high when I first mount it and I'll push down on the chassis and hit those stops and if you if you see when I hit the stops going down there's still a good I'd say three-eighths of an inch or even more to where the tire clears the body. What you don't want to have happen when you get all the downforce on the body is, or expansion of the tire, is you don't want the tire to hit the top of the body. It's like hitting the front brakes, the car will go nuts. So this is actually running a little high because I know I got a high mile an hour and I, I know there's gonna be a lot of downforce on the car with the speed. So I got th this body running pretty high on it to, to give it, you know, I can put a five pound weight on the top of this and the tires don't, hit the body at all so uh, that was my test to make sure I had enough clearance and spring on the car is I just put a five pound weight on the top I think that's about what the downforce is going to be and look and see how the suspension and the body reacts and if you see a mark on the paint after you run your body's too low or your tires expanding too much and it's a uh, uh, it can be catastrophic you wreck your car because of it so that's the down travel is give yourself some room some room um, and then once I get that, I go to the front bumper uh, and I cut this to where at completely compressed, it's an eighth of an inch off the ground or a little bit off the ground so that if I hit the brakes at the end or it's got a lot of downforce on the front, this body doesn't rub the ground. But it's as low as I can get it without it hitting the ground. So I compress the front completely make sure that this doesn't rub and to make sure I have some room uh, from the tire hitting the fender. Uh, and in the back, uh, I'm, I'm doing something similar. It's a little, a little easier because there's no front, front bumper to worry about hitting the ground, but I'm raising the back up and I'll run the car and I'll see if anything hits the tire. And if, uh, hey Mike, if something hits if it doesn't hit the tire then I'll lower it down and if I, I'll keep lowering it down until I get a mark and I, I get a hit on it and then I'll raise it back up a little bit the nice thing with the reactions is they don't expand so you don't have uh, you can run a pretty low body on it and on the inside of the body I run tape so I can tell if it hits the if it's close to the body by the marks in the tape without ruining the paint right so I do it on the front and I do it on the back and I just run a little uh, guides or or protectors for where the body is, is mounted but uh, that gets the body as low as you can get it without interfering with the tire and having the front front of the body at the ground so uh, I think that's about it hit me up with any questions if you got them and uh, I think people are starting to receive the chassis now so if uh, you got any questions I'm here to help um, I can either answer your text or give me a call or Anything I can do to help, I want to make sure that the first chassis that go out are a success and they're fast and anything I can do to help that, I'm here. So give me a message and uh, look forward to seeing the response of what you guys think of the chassis. So let me know if I can help in any way and I uh, look forward to talking to everybody. We'll see you.